morning my dear friends our topic for presentation today is x rays in surgery especially in general surgery so what is the importance of x rays it is a very much accessible imaging tool as far as a clinician is concerned in most of the other imaging tools the radiologist reads the report it is not like that in x rays in almost all cases of x-rays, the clinician itself reads the x-ray and many a times the clinician is better than radiologist in reading an x-ray. Whereas in CT, ultrasound, MRI, etc., always the radiologist makes the, gives the final report. That makes x-rays unique. So, we should know how to read an x-ray and make and to make a diagnosis or a professional diagnosis out of it correlating with the clinical findings. The application of reading x-rays in general surgery. This is what we are going to discuss today. The objective of our presentation today is to acquaint the medical student with the x-rays that we usually see in general surgery so that he will be able to interpret those x-rays. From an MBBS exam point of view, these are the x-rays which are generally kept for the exam. Now, in brief, we will discuss about abdominal x-ray. The abdominal x-ray is one of the most common x-rays which we see in general surgery because acute abdomen was comes very common in a surgery casualty. Then we will go into chest x-ray which is very much important in case of trauma and x-ray neck which has utility in thyroid cases in trauma but in our presentation we will generally more and more ourselves into the x-ray neck in case of trauma. These are again I, I say that these are the x-rays which are generally seen more by the clinician and not by the radiologist. Make it addictive that you take abdominal x-ray in all patients with acute abdomen but, but always ask regarding LMP in a patient with a fem in a female reproductive age group in case she is pregnant we should not want we do not want to give a damage to the fetus so we should always avoid a damage to fetus so in a female in reproductive age group caution before taking there should be caution before taking an abdominal x-ray erect. Now coming to the views of abdominal x-ray erect. The abdominal x-ray erect view is the most common view we generally take because we want we, we will get see important findings which we will go discuss in the further slide. This is the erect view. Now coming to the supine view which is the next common view we will take. Supine view will more than making a diagnosis, it will help us to add on to the findings that it will help us to give more information or add on information to the findings that we seen in the abdominal x-ray erect. Sometimes the patient may be and he will be unable to stay erect, especially debilitated people. In that case, abdominal x-ray left lateral decubitus view helps to give some amount of the idea which the abdominal x-ray erect view gives. We will discuss each one of these views in detail. So, first of all, we will discuss abdominal x-ray erect. This is the abdominal x-ray erect view. Initially, when we see an abdominal x-ray erect, we have a lot of doubts. Like, is the granularity we see here important? Or is this air shadow important? These are the initial confusions when we see an abdominal x-ray erect. But before looking into all those, always check the name, age, confirm the view, look for the and go in an orderly manner. Look for the bony skeleton initially, then look for the soft tissue shadows and finally the air shadows. It is sometimes very easy to say this. But all, most of the times our eye goes into the pathology or the diagnosis of the case. So what to do then? 
in the initial it is virtually impossible not to look into the pathology and go in for the orderly methodical view so go for the primary survey and make a professional diagnosis let it be air under diaphragm or air fluid levels anything but say then go in for the secondary survey where you will go methodically from the bony shadow to the soft tissue shadow to the air shadow and that that means you go from more white to lesser white and finally into the black so that we will be able we will not miss any important findings now in the next ray we will see a lot of things we have already said but what are we bothered about we are only bothered about the findings these are which are free air under diaphragm and air fluid levels what is the importance of these findings these are the findings if we miss the patient is going to die free air under diaphragm means perforation peritonitis air fluid levels means intestinal obstruction so if we are going to miss free air under diaphragm and air fluid levels the patient is going to die or or we will make the diagnosis later and the chance of mortality is going to be very high so we will come into this is a case of an air under diaphragm how will we detect air under diaphragm in an x ray the air is seen as black we say we can see the diaphragm we can see the both domes of the diaphragm here this is the right dome of the diaphragm and this is the left dome of the diaphragm so we see air on both these sides on the right side on the left side which air are we going to believe you see the air floats up when the patient stands erect the air floats up above above the liver and above the stomach and above the above the liver and above the stomach on the right side we have the liver and on the left side we have the stomach so the problem on the left side if we look for air under diaphragm on the left side is we have both the fundic air shadow and the air under diaphragm on the left side so what happens there is a confusion that whether it is a fundic air shadow or a air under diaphragm or under diaphragm is also called pneumoperitoneum so when you look for air under diaphragm always look on the right side above the liver below the diaphragm so i again repeat when you look for air under diaphragm always look on the right side above the liver below the diaphragm and a very interesting fact i would like you to notice here right, that even so even uh, even though i started as abdominal x ray erect what we are actually looking is the chest x ray chest x ray pa view erect view so what is this what is our inference even even a, a chest x ray can also be very helpful while taking and while in detecting an abdominal x ray in detecting a pneumoperitoneum now this is another case of air under diaphragm when we see an air under diaphragm in a patient it means that there is a hollow viscous perforation it can be a gastric perforation or a duodenal perforation and sometimes a sigmoid diverticular perforation or an appendicular perforation can also present as air under diaphragm what does it mean it means that it is a surgical emergency the sun should not set or and rise the sun should not set and rise on a perforation we should do a laparotomy and repair the perforation before that or else there is a high chance of mortality for the patient now this is another case of air under diaphragm the air under diaphragm may not be always very typical this is a mass case of massive pneumoperitoneum up following a trauma you can see the chest tube here okay and you can also see a subcutaneous emphysema here subcutaneous emphysema is also palpable on, on examination when we palpate the chest or abdomen if you see a subcutaneous emphysema you see a subcutaneous this may be most in, in this case it may be due to a diaphragmatic injury and the lung and the air from the lung might have escaped to the abdomen most probably so when you palpate and when you see a diaphragm when you see an 
subcutaneous emphysema or subcutaneous crackling, you should understand that there is an injury in the tracheobronchial pathway or an injury to the alveoli and that is there is an amount of pneumothorax. So, I say I again repeat that air under diaphragm may not be always subtle. It can also be like this in a dramatic manner. Now, what is here? What is this? This white arrow signify? Yes, it is also a case of pneumoperitoneum. What do you see here? You can see that you are not seeing it above the liver. You are seeing it on the towards the right side of the liver. Why? Because it is a left lateral decubitus view. This is the same x-ray as the previous slide. You can see the air floats above the liver. So, we are seeing the air under the air. Instead of seeing on the above the liver, we are seeing it more towards the right side of the liver as the air floats. And this is the due to because it is the left lateral decubitus view. So, this is the importance of the left lateral decubitus view. Sometimes the patient in peritonitis may be unable to stand up with the hollow viscous perforation and the peritonitis will be unable to stand up. In those cases, the left lateral decubitus view helps to detect the air under diaphragm. Now, you see this x-ray. On the left side, we have a normal abdominal x-ray, right? And on the right side, we are seeing the air multiple air fluid levels. So, does the, how when will we see air fluid levels? Do we see air fluid levels always in a normal x-ray or is it only in pathology or why are we not seeing this much air fluid levels in a normal abdominal x-ray erection? So, I am taking this bottle. You see this bottle. Okay. You see this bottle. There is fluid and there is air and you are seeing an air fluid level. Suppose I shake this bottle. Okay. Suppose I shake this bottle. Are you seeing an air fluid level? You won't. Because there will be no air fluid level when the bottle is in the in movement. Exactly the same thing happens in the abdomen. When there is peristalsis, the air and the fluid is being mixed and we are not going to see an air fluid level. But in case of intestinal obstruction, there is will be some amount of, there will be stasis. So, when there is stasis, what will happen? The bowel will go into ileus and there will be an air fluid level. So, wherever there is stasis, we can see an air fluid level. Please note that ileus, when, when I said that the bowel will go to ileus means, the ileus has nothing to do with, ileus has nothing to do with uh, ileum. Ileus, many a times when I say, when we see here paralytic ileus first, uh, our doubt is whether it is, uh, this has something to do with ileum. No, ileus has nothing to do with ileum. It means that it is a lack of, there is a lack of peristalsis in the bowel. So, whenever there is stasis in the abdomen, stasis in the bowel, there is air fluid levels. So, is there, a, is there areas where there are stasis in case of a normal abdomen or a normal, or do we see air fluid levels in normal abdominal x-ray, right? Yes. Where are they? They are at the points of sphincters, on the ileocecal junction, near the pylorus. We may see an air fluid levels. So, when we see two air fluid levels, it may not be a pathology. It can be near the pylorus and it can be near the ileocecal junction. But when we see more than two, when we see three or more air fluid levels, we will say there is a multiple air fluid levels. So, more the number of air fluid levels, the more the chance for intestinal obstruction is. Arbitrarily, we can say that there are, there is a, there are six air fluid levels, there is intestinal obstruction. But it is not a perfect dictum. When we are seeing, when there is, when there are more than, when there is three or more air fluid levels, there is, there is multiple air fluid levels and there is a chance for intestinal obstruction. Now that we have identified how to visualize a pneumoperitoneum and we have understood the importance of it as perforation peritonitis and to identify the multiple air fluid levels in the abdominal x-ray erect, x-ray erect, 
and to understand that it is suggestive of intestinal obstruction. Now we will try to read the multiple uh, shadows, multiple black shadows we see in the abdominal X-ray rect. Gastrointestinal tract in abdominal X-ray rect. In this following presentation, we will use in the following part of the presentation, we will use both the supine X-rays and the erect X-rays to identify the gastrointestinal tract. First, see this X-ray. This is an X-ray of the which part? Which part of the bowel? What? Which bowel? Which part? Bowel will be this much big, this much large, and showing this shape. Yes, you can see the. Yes, this is the greater curvature. No doubt about it. This is the greater curvature, and this is the lesser curvature, the antrum of the stomach. Yes, this is the stomach. We see in an abdominal X-ray supine view. Okay, supine view showing the dilated stomach. This is the erect view. We see the large air fluid level of the stomach. This is the erect abdominal X-ray erect view, where which this in this case the obstruction must be must be at the range of pylorus. We see a multiple. We see a single large air fluid level suggestive of the gastric outlet obstruction in this case. This is supine view and this is the erect view. Now, what is this case? This is a case of multiple air fluid levels. We will see air fluid level levels when we take an erect X-ray. Okay. Now, this is another X-ray showing multiple air fluid levels in an erect view. This is the X-ray of the above patient in the supine position. Can you see the difference? There is no air fluid levels in the supine view. There are no. This is the X-ray, the X-ray, erect X-ray showing the multiple air fluid levels. And in, in the supine X-ray, there are no air fluid levels. Why is it like that? Yeah. This is the erect view. You are seeing here the fish in the bowl. Okay, this is the erect view you are seeing here, and this is the supine view you are seeing downstairs. In the erect view, you can see the air fluid levels, but in supine view, we will not see any air fluid levels. This is the same thing that is happening in an abdominal X ray erect. In erect view, abdominal X ray. In erect view, air fluid level. In supine view, there is no air fluid levels. Then what is the, why do we want the supine x-ray? What is the use of the supine x-ray? See, now this is the supine view of the abdomen, abdomen and we have, we have seen earlier. What the, the earlier x-ray is this where we, had, we are seeing the multiple air fluid levels and this is the supine view. Of course, you will not see a multi see multiple air fluid levels in the supine view. You will see a multiple air fluid levels in the erect view. But what is more, what do then what do you see in the supine view? Yes, in the supine view, the fluid in the bowel floats down and the air in the bowel floats up, floats up. So what happens? You will see a better delineation of the bowel. So, to understand the bowel better, to understand the involved bowel better, to understand which bowel loop is dilated, supine view is much better than an erect view. For the diagnosis of an intestinal obstruction, erect view is better. But to understand which bowel is involved, supine view is better. So, it will help us to give, it will give us an idea into the level of obstruction, which level it is obstructed. Now, what are we seeing in this X-ray? We are seeing the valvule condimentus. What is this? Is the valvule condimentus? What is what is what is meant by valvule condimentus? If we see valvule condimentus, what does it mean? The involved bowel is the jejunum. Suppose we cut open the jejunum, you, we see the mucosal pattern in the jejunum like this in a spiral mode. The circles will be in the circles will be complete. There will be spiral, spiral, spiral like that. So, when we cut open the jejunum, the mucosal pattern is like this. 
So in X-ray, we will see the valvulae condimentus. Now, what about ileum? This is a picture of ileum. What is the importance in ileum? In an X-ray, the ileum is featureless. There is no characteristic feature of our ileum in X-ray. So, where is the level of obstruction in this case? How can we identify the level of obstruction in this case? In this case, we can say the obstruction is in the distal ileum. The colon is not dilated. The ileum is dilated. The obstruction will be in the distal ileum. So, we can identify the level of obstruction from a supine X-ray provided there is an multi there are multiplayer fluid levels in the direct X-ray. It's featureless. Now, we already know that this is the jejunum and we are seeing the valvulae condimented with a violet arrow. Now, do you see any other bowel in this? Yes, you can also see the featureless ileum here. Yes, this is the featureless ileum. So, how do we know where, the, where is the level of obstruction? The level of obstruction will be in the ileum. The jejunum is dilated, the ileum is dilated, the colon is not dilated, the level of obstruction will be in the, most probably in the ileum. Thus, we can again identify, we can identify different types of bowel, jejunum and ileum in the abdominal x-ray supine view. So, now we know to identify the stomach, the jejunum and the ileum in a supine x-ray, in an x-ray abdomen. Okay. Now, this is another X-ray we generally come across. Sometimes we see a loop in the X-ray like this. So, is these loops, is these dilated loops significant? That is the first question we comes to is come to our mind. Is this loop? Is there a paralytic ileus in this loop? Is the loop dilated? In case of abdominal inflammation. Inflamed, inflamed inflammation in the peritoneum, suppose say acute appendicitis or acute pancreatitis, a loop may be dilated which is adjacent to The loop which is touching onto the inflammation may go in for a paralytic ileus and it may be dilated. How do we know whether it is a dilated loop or not? As an arbitrary rule, if it is a small bowel, a more than 3 cm diameter is suggestive of dilatation. And if it is large bubble, a more than 6 cm, di 6 cm diameter is considered as a dilation. But this is an arbitrary rule. After some time, we will look into the sub, we will see the bubble. We, after some practice, the subjective assessment becomes more important than the objective assessment in case of centimeters. So, what is the bubble involved in this picture? It is the Jejunum. You can see, you are seeing the valvulae condimentus here. Right? This, you are seeing the valvulae condimentus here. So, the involved bowel is the jejunum. Now, why the jejunum is involved? In this case, it can be due to an occurred appendicitis and the jejunum will be dilated. And these types of loop, which is in relation, which is in close opposition to an inflammation, is called a sentinel loop. In appendicitis, you can get a sentinel loop. In acute pancreatitis, you can get a sentinel loop. So, whenever there is inflammation close to it, there can be, there will be a dilated loop. There will be a loop which has gone into ileus, which is called the sentinel loop. Why is it called sentinel loop? Sentinel? Yes. In olden times, this is the person. This is a person. Th these people will be generally in a more relaxed mode. And this person will be sitting in upside over the tree and he will be looking in. Who where is where the enemy is. When the enemy comes, he will be the person to see the enemy first and he will alarm the others. Exactly like this. Whenever there is an inflammation in abdomen, the loop nearby it go into paralytic ileus and it sounds the other part, it sounds to us that there is an inflammation, there is a war coming. This is called the sentinel loop and exactly 
whenever there is whenever there is an inflammation a loop near it can be inflamed which is called a sentinel loop now we have identified the jejunum and ileum next bowel we have to identify is the colon how will we identify the colon colon is generally located towards the periphery the jejunum and ileum is generally towards the center of abdomen even clinically this difference we can see in case of a small intestinal obstruction the distension will be in the central part of the abdomen in case of a large intestinal obstruction the distension will be in the peripheral part of the obstruction this is because the colon is located more towards periphery so one of the identification features of colon is it is located more towards the periphery of the abdomen next hostrations this these are, these are the hostrations we see in the colon we are seeing the hostrations here in the colon how will we do the difference between the hostrations and valvular condimentus hostration this is a colonoscopic view okay? this is a colonoscopic view we will see that the hostrations are not complete circles they are generally incomplete circles exactly like that in valvular condimentus we had seen the complete circle we are here the hostrations we see as incomplete circle another thing so we have a doubt whether there is obstruction in this case suppose this is a normal x-ray or not we have a doubt how will we understand that for that for the to be obstruction there will be a certain cut off of the gas in the colon we can see that there is no sudden cut off like that and we are seeing this is the rectal gas this is also very important suppose we are seeing rectal gas we can be sure that until that point there is no obstruction so there there is no sudden cut off of the air in the colon and there is rectal gas we can very well say that there is no obstruction until the level of rectum now this is another case what is this this is a case of large bowel obstruction how will we say that this is large bowel obstruction we are seeing a dilated bowel here once dilated large bowel here more than 6 cm diameter okay now this was this is our earlier x ray okay here we are not seeing here the, the, we can very well see that the large bowel is dilated next thing we will see that the host traits there are multiple air fluid levels there are multiple air fluid levels suggestive of large bowel obstruction the third thing which comes to our help is it that there are hostrations the hostrations in the large bowel in this case unlike in the earlier normal x-ray are effaced the effacement of hostration is another feature of large bowel obstruction and the fourth feature that comes to our help is there is no colon cut off sign the colon we can see that the bowel in the gas in the large bowel is suddenly cut off at the level of sigmoid colon here sigmoid or the lower descending colon so in this case there is no cut off the colon cut off the sudden cut off of the colonic air is another feature of obstruction and the next feature that helps to identify the large bowel obstruction is the presence of absence of rectal gas in this case you can see a rectal gas in the normal abdominal x ray but we are seeing no rectal gas in this case this is another feature that will help us to identify whether there is large bowel obstruction or not so this is a case of large bowel obstruction showing the effacement of the hostrations dilatation of the large bowel multiple air fluid levels sudden cut off of the colonic gas and the absence of rectal gas now we have seen the large bowel obstruction and how will we identify the large bowel obstruction but what about the sigmoid colon in sigmoid colon unlike the ascending descending and transverse colon the hostrations are not very clearly seen the hostrations become less pronounced so how will we know whether the sigmoid colon is dilated this is the classical picture of sigmoid volvulus one of the most common cause of sigmoid colon obstruction showing what appearance yes this is called the coffee bean appearance which is seen in the sigmoid colon exactly this in the 
coffee bean shape. So, keep this picture in mind. Sigmoid volvulus coffee bean appearance. Now, this is one of the most common x-rays. What is the most common x-rays we see? You see that dark circle, the black circle. What do you see? That granular thing. This may be the most common finding we see in an x-ray, but they are the fecal matter. Don't think it is a pathology. It is the fecal matter we are seeing in the x-rays. Now, these are the basic, what we have seen that the, they are the basic guidelines of seeing an abdominal x-ray. In your clinical practice, while you learn, you will come across a one, one many a lot of wonderful x-rays as far as wonderful abdominal x-rays. When you see those x-rays, apply the basic principle. The bony skeleton, the air, the soft tissue, the erect view, the multiple air fluid levels, the supine view, the different types of bowel, the stomach, ileum, valvular condiments, everything. You apply all these into it. You will be able to identify the pathology and you will be able to reach a diagnosis in most of the cases, but always clinically correlate. Now, since we have finished of the abdominal x-ray, we will come to the chest x-ray. Many a times, the problem with the surgeons is in many of the elective cases, we will just make a glance at the chest x-ray and we will leave it to the anesthetist. In preoperative checkup, anyway, they will check it. So, what is the big deal? So, most of the times, we may just sideline the chest x-ray. But when it comes to trauma case, when it comes to the surgery casualty, chest x-ray is very important. We have to, it becomes a point of saving and losing a life. To correct, when we, if you are able to correctly read a chest x-ray, we can many a times save lives. In case of pneumothorax, in case of chemothorax, we will come to it. So, this is how a chest x-ray is taken. It is generally a PA, PA view. But in many trauma cases, if the patient can't be mobilized, suppose a case like this comes, we will have to adjust with the AP view. Okay. So, this is the classical chest x-ray PA view. Now, when we see an x-ray like this, how will our eye go about it? Obviously, I have said earlier that we have a tendency to go into the pathology first. It is okay. But after the primary survey, go in for the secondary survey. So, how will our eye go into it? First, look in for the, after the primary survey, when we go in for the methodical survey, look in for the bony skeleton. First, we look at the clavicle, the scapula, then e go for the each rib, the first rib, the second rib, the third second rib, the third rib, go in a methodical manner for each of the ribs. Go from the right side to the like this, like this, like this, then to the and start to the on the left side also you see each ribs in the same way. This will help us to identify the any defects in the bony skeleton, if there is a scap clavicle fracture, scapula fractures, rib fractures, etc., you should identify. After the after the bony skeleton, you go in for the medial stain. Look at the medial stain. You can see the trachea here first. You go in for you look at the medial stain like this. You see the trachea here, and then you see the cardiac shadows in the Media stain. So, in the media stain, you should go in this fashion. You will see the different parts of the media stain. After this, once we see the, how will we know the, uh, how will we know the different parts of the cardiac shadow? We have to know the different parts of the cardiac shadow. This is the aortic knuckle, the pulmonary trunk, which is more. We will see this a concavity rather than the convexity. The left auricle and the left ventricle. We will see the superior vena cava, right atrium, and the inferior vena cava on the right side. 
and the inferior border of the cardiac shadow is mainly formed by the right ventricle. Now, after we have seen the mediastinum, now we should go in for the air spaces. You see the lung, lung like this. You start from this side. You go like this, go like this. You see the black part of it. Now you are concentrating on the black part of the air shadow now, not on the white ribs. They are concentrating. We look for the cardiophrenic angle here. We look for the costophrenic angle here. Now coming here, you again look at this cardiophrenic angle, this costophrenic angle. During this period, you have to see the domes of the diaphragm. Then go like this, go like this, go like this towards the opposite side, concentrating on the air all the way, all these times, concentrate on the air shadow of it. Now, at last, you see the subcutaneous spaces, the soft tissue shadow for the release to see whether there is any emphysema or subcutaneous emphysema or surgical emphysema. Now, one of our professors once asked us, what is the x-ray? Is this x-ray a male patient or a female patient? It is an x-ray of the female patient. This part is not a lung margin. It is a breast shadow. So, always you should know to identify a breast shadow. Don't, uh, don't mistake for lung margin. You can see the markings of the lung here beyond the margin of the breast. Now, Identify the chest x -ray. This is a case of right pneumothorax. When we say it is a right pneumothorax, it is easy to diagnose. But how will we say whether there is a how which are the diagnostic points which will help us to identify that it is a pneumothorax? One, you have to identify the lung margin. This is the lung margin here. You have to identify the lung margin. This is the lung margin here. Next, second case, the absence of the parenchymal markings. These are the parenchymal markings. The absence of the parenchymal, mark, parenchymal markings outside the lung margin. There are no parenchymal markings here. Here you can see the parenchymal markings. And finally, not in all of the cases, but in some cases, there will be a mediastinal shift. Identifying the pneumothorax is very important and the action has to be taken immediately because it will be life-saving. Now, this is another case of pneumothorax, right pneumothorax, again you can see that, but in this case the pneumothorax may not be always very pronounced, you can again, it can be subtle also, you can see the lung margin here, the absence of parenchymal margin here, but there is not much of a mediastinal shift because there is a small pneumothorax. Now, what is this? This is also a case of pneumothorax you are but you are not seeing the lung margin you are not seeing the bronchovascular markings how do you say that this is pneumothorax what i mean what are you seeing then is it the pectoralis major yes those it is the pectoralis major you are seeing it is the fibers of the pectoralis major that you are seeing how are, i am not see, i don't see the pectoralis major fibers normally how can i see the pectoralis major now because the air from the lung or the air from the respiratory tract has passed down has due to its higher pressure because there is leakage of air because there is pneumothorax it has passed down due to the different layers so in between the layers of the pectoralis major major and each of the fibers are visible and this is called the surgical emphysema when it comes into the subcutaneous space we call it as subcutaneous emphysema when the air dissects like a surgeon into the different layers of the, the different layers of the muscle the subcutaneous tissue we call it as the surgical emphysema when we see surgical emphysema it means there is pneumothorax or there is a tracheal injury intercostal drainage intercostal drainage intercostal drainage don't wait to see for the wait for the lung margin don't wait for the ct it is the treatment is intercostal drainage because there is pneumothorax but how did the pectoralis major become visible? Answer is still outside. Basically, in an X-ray, we know that there is an air density, soft tissue density, and a bone density. If two densities of the same kind are in contact, 
we will it will the margins will not be visible this is called sill out sign why is it called sill out sign we will see this is a sill out see this female and the male when the soft tissue density of the male is in contact with the soft tissue density of the female we are not seeing the margin likewise when the soft tissue density of the pectoralis major is in contact with the soft tissue density of another fiber of pectoralis major we are not seeing the different fibers of the pectoralis major but in case of a surgical emphysema the air comes between when the air density comes in between the two soft tissue densities we will clearly see the margins like like what we see in this sill out so this is called a sill out sign so in case of a surgical emphysema we will see the different fibers of the pectoralis major we can also see the intercostal drainage which is which is the treatment of the same now this is another x-ray which we commonly see in our clinical practice what is this x-ray this is a case of consolidation even though generally consolidation is treated with medicine respiratory medicine postoperatively in many patients we will come across the consolidation or pneumonia if when we see consolidation it is also called it is pneumonia generally it is pneumonia in surgical practice there are other reasons for consolidation but in surgical practice generally when we see consolidation it is pneumonia how will we know whether it is whether it is a consolidation or a pneumonia we will see this some some amount of air in between this when that is called air bronchogram when the air when we see in between the uh, between the white shadow when we see this air shadows we can very well make sure that it is a consolidation it is this suggestive of pneumonia so air bronchogram is the when we see air bronchogram there is it, it is generally pneumonia but there are other causes also but generally most commonly it will be pneumonia what exactly is air bronchogram suppose here there is a bronchus when the bronchus is coming from here when the in the trachea and the mediastinum we can see clearly the air so when the bronchus has divided and comes into the lung parenchyma it is surrounded by it is surrounded by the air 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 filled alveoli so we no more see the margins of the bronchus because it is the air density in the bronchus and the air density in the alveoli is same so we are no more seeing its margins but once there is consolidation around the bronchus we will start seeing the air shadow inside the bronchus we will start seeing the air shadow inside the bronchus this is called air bronchogram air bronchogram in an x-ray is suggestive of pneumonia now these are the lobes of the lung why why do we want to show the lobes of the lung i am showing the lobes of the lung because we can see on the right side on the right side of the lung the lower part of the lung is formed by the lower lobe and the middle lobe so when you see an opacification in the lower zone of the x-ray it can be either a lower lobe consolidation see the posterior part is more formed by the lower lobe the anterior part is formed by the middle lobe there is a doubt that whether this is a lower lobe pneumonia or a middle lobe pneumonia so that means in when in the x-ray in the lower zone when there is a consolidation when there is a consolidation we have a doubt whether it is a lower lobe pneumonia or a middle lobe pneumonia i will show you x-ray you see one of this is a middle lobe pneumonia one of this is a lower lobe pneumonia how will you identify both are x-rays showing consolidation on the lower lower part of the x-ray on the lower zone of the x-ray one is a middle lobe pneumonia one is a lower lobe pneumonia we will identify this again t this is the x ray of middle lobe pneumonia how will you identify it you can see that the middle lobe here is in close opposition with the cardiac shadow the cardiac shadow is a fluid is blood filled so it is white in color the middle lobe is normally black so in case of consolidation the middle lobe turns white so the fluid density in the middle lobe is in opposition with the fluid density in the cardiac shadow the result is you will not be able to see the cardiac sill out the sill out sign comes to your help here when the soft tissue density or the fluid density of the middle lobe 
is in contact with the cardiac density of the heart, the soft tissue density of the heart, we will no more see the cardiac silhouette. So, if we are seeing a lower low consolidation and if we are not seeing the cardiac border, we can very well say that it is a middle lobe pneumonia. Now, this is a case of the lower lobe pneumonia. We know that the middle lobe is in close-up position. So, there is an air density in between the cardiac shadow and the consolidation in the lower lobe. So, we can see the border of the heart. So, if the cardiac sillout is visible in case of a lower lobe consolidation, we can very well say that it is a lower lobe pneumonia. That is how we identify the difference between a lower lobe pneumonia and a middle lobe pneumonia. Cardiac shadow seen, cardiac sillout seen, lower lobe pneumonia. Cardiac sillout not seen, middle lobe pneumonia. Now, this is a case of pleural effusion. This is a case of left-sided pleural effusion. How will we differentiate between the pneumonia? One thing is that we can say we can we are not seeing any air inside the white of the pleural fluid. It is fully white. That means it is a pleural effusion. There is no air bronchogram. It is not a like consolidation. Next thing it helps us, you see the fluid in the test tube. You can see the fluid is it in a curvy look. It is in like a meniscus. This is due to this look of this fluid. At the edge, it just comes up near to the glass. It comes up to the glass. This meniscus appearance of the fluid is due to the surface tension of the fluid. Exactly this meniscus sign happens in the pleural fluid. Pleural fluid. So, in case of a pleural fluid, pleural effusion, there is also a meniscus sign. We are not going to see a meniscus sign in case of a hydropneumothorax. In case of hydropneumothorax, the line will uh, hydropneumothorax, the line will be a straight line. We are not going to go into detail about the hydropneumothorax because it is more towards a medical case. We will deal with the right hemothorax. This is an X-ray after a gunshot injury showing a right hemothorax. Again, we are seeing the some amount of meniscus sign here. We will only see these types of hemothorax if the patient stands erect to see the air fluid level. But generally, our patients will be in this position. They will not be in a condition to be made erect. So, most of our trauma patients will come like this and we will be only be, we will have to contact with the supine x-ray. This is an x-ray. This x-ray, when we see at first, we will feel that there is no problem. But this is a case of hemothorax. This is a case of right hemothorax. This is a supine view. We are not seeing a definite air fluid level. Say, this is a supine view. We, we know that there is water in that bucket. How? Of course, we will see the we know that there is water. No, of course, we see the fish swimming in it, so that we know. So we know that there is water. But apart from that, we will see a haziness. We will see that hazy blue there. So, if there is a hazy blue, if there is a haziness, it means that there is some amount of fluid there. In a supine view, we are going to see the fluid like that. In this condition, on the right side, we are seeing the haziness. So this. Yes, this is a case after trauma, when we are seeing a haziness on one side, we should suspect hemothorax. Obviously, there is a, we should see for the lung markings in the opposite side to make sure that it is not the opposite side pneumothorax. Look for the lung markings on the opposite side to make sure that it is not the opposite side pneumothorax. See that, that there is haziness on one side it is, and see confirm that the view is supine that it, it, it will be a hemothorax. In clinical practice, if we have only x-ray, not CT, in, there is no CT and you have only x-ray in, in your armamentarium or the patient cannot be mobilized or if the patient is in ventilator, what we can do is, we can take serial x-rays and see that whether the haziness is increasing. If the haziness is increasing, there is continuous bleeding and we can make a decision 
that we should put an intercostal drainage tube. That is how a supine X-ray, the serial supine X-rays can help us to make a decision to put and whether to put an intercostal drainage tube or not in case of a hemothorax. Right, hemothorax. Now, we will come across gen, in, in general surgery, we will come across, ne, come across neck X-ray also. We will mainly deal with trauma in case of a neck X-ray. This is a neck X-ray showing the normal curvature. This is a normal curvature of the cervical spine. When we see a curvature like this, when we see this curvature, three lines should come into our mind. One line is along the anterior part of the vertebral body. Okay, one line is along the anterior part of the vertebral body here. The second line along the posterior part of the vertebral body and the third line along the spine of the vertebra. So, anterior part of the vertebral body, posterior part of the vertebral body and along the side, spine of the vertebra. All these three lines will show the curvature. Suppose a curvature is lost in any of the lines, suspect a pathology, suspect a fracture, suspect a subluxation. And we will then we will go in for a further investigation. This is a case of cervical spine straightening. We are not at all seeing the curvature. We can see the all the three lines, the anterior vertebral line, the posterior vertebral body line and the spinal line. All three are straightened. All three are straightened. There is some sort of cervical injury. Why does this happen? Why does this thing happen? This happens because when there is a trauma to the neck, whenever there is trauma anywhere in our body, the muscles around us, around the involved joint goes into spasm. Why the curvature is maintained? The curvature is maintained because of the difference in tone between the anti-gravity and the pro-gravity muscles. When the muscles goes into the spasm, the suddenly the spine get becomes spine will become straightened. There will be no longer the curvature due to the inherent tone, inherent tone of the muscles. So when we see a curvature, it is good, and when we are seeing straightening, there is some sort of a cervical spine injury. This is another x-ray showing cervical spine injury. There is a stepping in that line which, came, which, is, which will be due to a subluxation. We should not miss a cervical spine injury because if we miss a cervical and spine injury, it can result in quadriplegia or a diaphragmatic paralysis and death of the patient. So, in brief, what we have discussed, we have discussed the abdominal x-rays, which are our bread and butter as far as a general surgeon is concerned. Chest x-rays especially will be helpful in trauma, neck x-rays in trauma and different types of, and what I, the take home message before all this is, don't just diagnose the x-ray. Before seeing the x-ray, always go and see the patient. See the patient clinically examine the patient and after that only see the x-ray. Then after clinical examination when you see the x-ray, the findings you will get will be much more than seeing the x-ray alone and try to clinically correlate the x-ray and the patient. Don't make a diagnosis alone from the patient. Don't make a diagnosis alone from the x-ray. Clinically correlate the findings in the patient and the x-ray and finally, make a diagnosis. Most of the times, you will hit the bullseye. Thank you for your patient listening and best of luck for your future. Thank you.